May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, O Spirit of Freedom. So I'll start the webinar here. I believe all of you have um, received a copy of a couple of handouts that I sent along with the charts for this presentation. So if I'm referring to the handouts, that's what I'm referring to. Okay. Oops. Oops, I think I just went. The agenda. I'll give a little bit of introduction and then talk about what the faith leader's role is in mental health and in, I'll talk about mental disorders and what the faith leader's role is in mental disorders. Talk a little bit about suicide and then about families because families of people that have mental health difficulties are suffering also, but in a different way. Um, and uh, at the end, I'll talk about religiosity and give you some resources. So the way that mental health is defined is the ability to have productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, and the ability to cope with change and adversity. And mental disorder, um, and these definitions come from the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is what is used to diagnose mental health difficulties. Mental disorder is an alteration in your thinking, your mood, or your behavior that cause distress and or impaired functioning. So someone can have an odd move, mood or behavior, but it's not causing them distress or impaired functioning, and they're just having an odd, had odd behavior that don't have a mental disorder. And it's um, explicitly stated like this that not to over pathologize um, behaviors. So when you think about what mental health and mental disorder are, it isn't just you're mentally healthy and or you're mentally, you have a mental disorder. It's a continuum and people move back and forth on this continuum during their life, and everyone experiences emotional distress at, at times. So the things that we learn how to deal with uh, people with mental disorders can be helpful uh, for anybody at any point along this continuum. So I know that our pews are filled with people who are suffering from mental health and mental health problems. Um, the way that I know this is that I myself, as a person who has lived with a mental health difficulty, have, have um, and in fact, that's one of the things that has informed my, my ministry. Um, when I'm invited to talk in front of a congregation, and now I've done it in many places, uh, I tell a little bit of my own story about um, my uh, postpartum depression and the fact that I was hospitalized for it. And then the, a number of years later, I was hospitalized again. And I do it deliberately, not because I, my story is any particularly uh, unique or wonderful, but because I know that when somebody who's, who is an, a respected authority figure stands up in front of a congregation and tells their own personal story that it makes it safe for other people in the congregation to um, admit to themselves and to their friends that yes this is part of what my story is too. At the end of my my sermons what I do is I ask that people I ask for what I call public witness that I ask for people to stand as willing and able if they or a loved one is living with a mental health problem. And every time I've done this, it's somewhere between 80% and 100% of the people who stand up. 
and nobody can believe how many people are standing up and they all look around just completely amazed that you mean all, you too you too and it suddenly becomes a safe thing to talk about in coffee hour oh yeah my sister had this or my brother had this or i had this but i i was talking about the fact that at the end of my sermon i asked for a public witness of people who um if to stand as willing and able if they or someone they love is living with a mental health problem and almost uh, there's a very large majority of the people that stand up just about everywhere that i've been and it makes it safe for them to then talk about mental health in their congregation so that's the most significant thing that i have found um, to get rid of mental health stigma in a congregation is to have somebody doesn't have to be the minister but some somebody some respected person in the congregation telling their story and then have people witness that so when you're recovering from a mental health difficulty um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you eliminate all symptoms and that you never have to take medication again what it means is that you're found a way to live in the world that that is meaningful for you and for um, the other people in your life. And it usually takes um, a whole bunch of different dimensions to it. And here I've listed uh, seven major categories. So the body is, is well, you know, maybe this involves taking medications. You have relationships that are satisfying. You have an environment that um, you can exist in either by where you live or the or when you go outside in in the fresh air and so far some connection with the environment you have spirit you have a role for spirituality in your life you have some sort of meaningful work or something to do with your time that you find as be meaningful um, have a way to play um pla the y should be after that um that um uh, in fact that's often one of the things that's missing if you uh talk talk with individuals uh, when i'm talking to people in you know where i work um in a mental health center about what do they do for fun where do they play? And a lot of times they look at you and say, fun, what's that, you know? And I know that would have been my answer uh, years ago when I was suffering that. Um, but something, fun is necessary part of life and needs to be part of, of one's recovery. And then also your mind needs to be stimulated and learning new things, finding out new things. So all of those things are stimulated um, and need to be part of a person's recovery. And often what I do is um, when I'm talking to somebody who's having difficulty, I'll try to ask myself what's missing and uh, go through these, these seven types of things and, and then see if I can work with the person to find out how to um, enrich that part of their life if it's completely missing. So ask yourself what the congregation have to do with all of this. Well, um, a religious congregation has an important elements that we have there. Um, perhaps not the body. I mean, we don't we don't um, give out medications or anything. But relationships, yes, that's central to what a, a congregation is. An environment connection with, you know. Many congregations have a way ways to you know go outside, get involved with green sanctuary, do something like that. Um, there are ways to to um, enrich your mind by listening to um, the sermons and other things that that a congregation has. Ways to have fun together, potlucks, things like that. Um, ways to do work that's meaningful a lot of committee work and so forth in congregations is very people find it very meaningful because i think they're contributing to something important and then of course spirituality is really a central role of what congregations do so when you look at all of the the, the ways that contributions to people recovering from mental health problems 
the, the congregation really plays a major role in many of those things. So that's why it's important um, to know this stuff <laughs> as uh, congregational leaders. So what is it that a faith leader's role is? First of all, you understand what people heal in relationships. So if they're, when they're in a congregation and having relationships to other people, that's sort of central to how people heal. What a faith leader can do is impart a calm presence to an individual, a sense that the person is loved and accepted unconditionally. It doesn't mean without um, boundaries, but it means that they are loved and accepted, um, that there's a sense of hope. Um, many times that's missing in folks that come. Um, visits, uh, so um, that means if a person is, is been hospitalized in a psychiatric ward that you offer to visit them just like you'd visit anybody else in the hospital. Sometimes people don't want visitors, but I remember when I was hospitalized, I was so grateful when people came to visit me. And I, even though it was almost 40 years ago, I still remember everyone who came to visit me. Um, encouragement in the recovery, you know, especially when things are not going well. Um, spiritual practices that might be important, or prayer, or meditation, or music, or something that's important to them spiritually. I shouldn't have to say this, but no cruelty in church, you know, no making jokes about crazy people from the pulpit or other places. Um, confrontation if they are in denial or if they're disruptive. Um, has apprehension, palpitation, shortness of breath. Many, many times people think they're having a heart attack. It's a compulsive category, the presence of obsessions, which means persistent thoughts that are unwanted or compulsive deal with their obsessions. Trauma or stress-related, um, they're disorders in which there's exposure to a traumatic event that causes a psychological distress. You hear a lot about that recently. Depression means a disturbance of mood, very low mood. And bipolar means alternating low and high moods. There's a category called schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. That means the presence of delusions, which means a person believes something that is untrue. Um, hallucinations, meaning that they're seeing or hearing something that's not there and sometimes um, disorganized speech or behavior. Neurodevelopmental, which is typically in a child's developmental period. Personality disorders means an endearing pattern of inner experience since ad adolescence. And then substance-related disorders are a result from taking a substance. So I'll talk about um, you know, sort of these categories and what a person can do. So for anxiety and OCD and trauma, the disorders you usually hear about that are general anxiety disorder is a prolonged excessive worry, a panic attack, which is sudden uh, intense anxiety or terror, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, I talked about um, compulsions and obsessions, and PTSD uh, happens after a traumatic event. What can a faith leader do? A calm presence in a quiet place. I remember when I was an intern, and this was in San Francisco, there was, um, so those of you from San Francisco <laughs> may remember me from there, I don't know. But one, one Sunday when I was an intern, there was a woman there was very distressed. And right before a, a service, when people were running around getting ready for the service and so forth, and she came up to me, you know, and was, very distressed and didn't know what to do and I didn't know what to do either I was just an intern but I finally said why don't we go in this this other room over here and just sit down for a while and so we went into the library and sat down and I think I was holding your hand and I was thinking to myself what can I say what can I say what can I do and um, not knowing what to say and after a couple of minutes she said I feel so much better just being here with you. That was such a lesson to me to know that a presence 
calm presence in itself is a gift. And it, it just being there quietly is a real gift, especially someone who's very anxious. So I'm, I'm in, uh, feel very grateful to that woman to teaching me that lesson. So what can you do? You can mention that there is effective treatment, that there are consumer coping strategies that one of the handouts that I have has a, has a page for consumer coping strategies. And I'll talk about them in, in a second on the next chart about what that means. Um, VA hospitals, if the person is a veteran, has PTSD, they have, they have special programs for that. And you can encourage them to continue in their therapy, continue in a wrap group, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then ask your second, ask yourself, is there a religious dimension to this? Are they, they seeing this as something that's uh, religiously important to them? So coping strategies, this is um, in your handout. Um, I think it's page 26. Um, there's a, a, a number of things that I've collected together from various people that had anxiety um, and various other kinds of, of disorders from things that have helped them. And usually it comes into these categories, professional and or peer help. Um, both of those kinds can help you. Um, some people don't find help with professionals and peers be very, very helpful, but some combination of that could be very helpful. Um, personal care of themselves, getting enough sleep, getting uh, eating well and so forth. Stress management, um, how to cut down on the stress levels. Emotional self-awareness, that means you know that you're depressed or you know that, um, that this is is a situation that you don't want to be in. Life enrichment, which is a, a bunch of things that you can do to enrich your life and creativity and the other things. And then spirituality. So if you look at that handout, and sometimes what I've done is just take that page, Xeroxed it and handed it to somebody and said, here are things that have helped other people that have had um, the mental health problems. They don't work for each one of them doesn't work for everybody, but there's something on that page that, that has, has helped somebody. And so you might want to take a look at it and see what's helpful to you. And many times that's very helpful. RAP, which I talked about before, was a wellness recovery action plan. It's a uh, self-designed evidence-based plan for staying well and, and empowering yourself to understand where you are. It consists of a daily maintenance toolbox or how to keep yourself well. Um, not, it, it allows you to figure out what your triggers are. So what is it that triggers you into this kind of, uh, of um, mental uh, anguish? And are there early, early warning signs I can pay attention to? Because a lot of times if you catch something early that you don't have to go through it. it um, the RAP plan also allows you to detail what you do when things are breaking down. So here's things that I want to, that I know that are going to help me. And then in a, you can make an advanced directive for yourself that if you're in crisis, here's the doctor I want you to talk to. Here's the hospital I want to go to. Here's the hospital I do not want to go to. And so the person has, an, has a sense of being in control even when they're not in control. This is really very, very helpful. Um, we've had... Um, since we've been using this in the mental health center where I have many fewer hospitalizations than there used to be. And it's used all over the country and really all over the world now. Um, so I definitely recommend this for anybody with problems, <laughs> mental health problems. And the, here's a lady that it developed it, Mary Ellen Copeland. Um, and there's a website that you can look on there. Um, and I am, they, they have, they, they can tell you where some of the groups are. There's, there's a number of local groups here in the Bay Area, and I know there are for in other parts of, of um, the country as well. So you can take a look there and find out. Okay, depression. Uh, what's going on with someone with depression? Depressed mood most of the day, in, inability to find pleasure. Sometimes significant weight loss or gain. All of these don't happen to every single person, but these are things that happen 
typically, um, either insomnia or hypersomnia, sleeping all the time or not be able to sleep, fatigue, feeling that you're worthless, you, that you can't concentrate on anything, and also thoughts of death and wanting to die. Very uh, Suicide is, is a real danger with a person with depression. So bipolar disorder is an alternating between depression and mania. And what mania is, is um, the opposite of depression. You're inflated self-esteem. You don't have to sleep. You're talkative. You have lots of ideas. You're very creative. You can be also distract, very distracted. And, you can and people sometimes involve themselves in high-risk pleasurable activities, you know, like unsafe sex, driving really fast, spending all their money, things like that. So for depression and bipolar disorder, um, again, what helps? Love and acceptance, calm presence. If they're suicidal, to get immediate attention, and I'll talk about suicide a little bit later. Um, you encourage them to get professional therapy, peer group support, share that page 26 on coping strategies, um, encourage them to think about a rap group if they can. And if they're bipolar, um, sometimes it helps to keep, tr to suggest that they keep a timeline, like um, if they're, if they're um, going, to, that they go through these mood swings, how often is it? It's once a month or is it once a day? Is it once every six months or what is it? And sometimes that helps people to get an, an idea and also helps doctors to help you figure out how to, how to treat it. If somebody is being disruptive, you can set boundaries for behavior. I'll talk a little bit about boundaries, boundaries later. And also, uh, sometimes people have a religious dimension to the, this, thinking that, that um, they have a mission that God has given them a mission to do some, some of this work. Also, I should mention that there are very uh, many very, very creative people have uh, bipolar disorder. In fact, I think more so than, than just in the general population. So it isn't like the stuff is bad. It's just like getting the worst parts of it to not be there is what I think the aim should be. Psychotic disorders, uh, uh, the ones that are most um, often diagnosed as schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, which is basically schizophrenia plus either with depression or bipolar disorder on top of schizophrenia. The symptoms are delusions, meaning you believe things that are not true and there's no way that people can talk you out of them. Um, hallucinations, it's usually hearing voices. Sometimes it's smelling things or tasting things or feeling things crawling on your body or something like that, um, but things that nobody else sees or hears or feels. Um, disorganized speech. Um, we sometimes call derailment or incoherence, where they sort of start one sentence and they don't even get through that sentence. They jump onto the next sentence and so forth, and you can't really, really um, follow their train of thought. You know, they're saying things, but you can't really follow what it is they're saying. And then grossly disorganized or catatonic, catatonic behavior. And what what that really means is a catatonic behavior is many times where people are just stuck and they don't move. They hold strange odd poses and don't move um, and um, or grossly disorganized which means they simply can't take can't care for themselves at all so learn how to com communicate effectively in on page uh, 28 of your handout and someone asked this um, in the uh, question beforehand saying, what is it that I can do when somebody has lost touch with reality? On page 28 of the handout, it talks about a number of different things that one that a person can do. Um, and it ba basically um, is, you know, trying to be clear and calm and not have an emotional reaction to people because that just makes things worse. So um, if you take a look at that, that would be helpful. I think I have a, a chart on this a little bit later. Um, suggest keeping the person from being isolated um, because people heal when they're with in, in a relationship with other people. Again, a rap group can be helpful. 
education for the family because a lot of times there's tension between family and the and the individual education of them family knowing how to communicate and uh, what i see here is finding an angel so in a in a, a congregation um sometimes there are people that that can be comfortable sitting next to somebody who's who is uh disruptive on uh, and then if the or, or is potentially disruptive or is has um has one of these psychotic disorders and if the person starts becoming agitated suggested the person why don't you and i go outside and talk together for a while and it, so it isn't like you're kicking the person out it's like you're caring for that person in a way that that person knows you're not kicking them out you're being with them still and you still care about them and um, many times congregations there are one or two folks that can act like this in this uh, type of um, behavior and um, not everyone can do it but some, there are some people that can and that are very good at it um, I say take care with meditation sometimes when people especially when they're in the in the midst of a, uh, a crisis meditation can um, make them get lost in their voices or lost you know makes them further psychotic um, However, when people are, are, you know, sort of in a good place, meditation can be very beneficial. So it's, it's you know, sort of uh, trying to judge where a person is. You know, if, it, if you think it's making, going to make a person worse, then you don't do it. But if, it, if you think the person is basically doing okay that day, then it might be very helpful to, for them to sit quietly or to listen to music for a while. And again, a number of these people have what they, they believe is religious component that God is talking to them or the devil is talking to them or somebody's you know, religiously is talking to them to ask that question. I'll talk a little bit later about how, um, what, what one can do with that. If they're disruptive, you don't set boundaries so that you don't let them um, disrupt the, the work of the congregation. So, um, Okay, these are uh, communication guidelines for people who are, are having um, a break with reality. First, you show compassion. Know they know that you care, so that they know that you care about them. There are guidelines how to communicate effectively. In that that handout on page twenty six, it has a whole bunch of different um, uh, uh, situations and how how you can express things how to make positive requests, how to express negative feelings, how to appraise, give praise to people, and then also what to avoid. Um, and basically what you avoid is anything that's very emotional or confrontational, that kind of thing is just makes things worse. But, but the details on that are all on that page 28 if you wanna look at that. Um, okay, neurodevelopmental, this is uh, for basically uh, things that happen in, in onsetting in the child developmental period typically. Um, you probably heard of attention deficit, deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, um, a persistent pattern where the child can't pay attention or is very hyperactive or impulsive. Um, Conduct disorder is a little more serious where a persistent pattern of behavior in which the rights of others or society rules are, societal rules are violated. Um, autism spectrum, so that's, you know, um, you hear a lot about autism these days, that's under this category of neurodevelopmental. And adverse childhood experiences are called ACEs. They, they can influence developmental, development of mental disorders later in life. In fact, the more adverse childhood uh, experiences people have had, the, the worse um, kind of mental health disorders, there's a real direct correlation to that. So what can the faith leader do? First, you make a commitment that you're going to welcome all children and you train your congregation members and RE teachers that are dealing with the children um, and how to how to do this and there's a there's a book written by, written by Sally Patton it's called welcoming children with special needs it's a um, Skinner house book a really very very excellent book on talking about how how to develop a program as special needs 
The family may need experience. They may be experiencing denial, anger, resentment, grief, or shame, or helplessness, and a way to support, let them know that the family, that, that you're there for the family as well. Um, and the kind of things that, that one might suggest is to encourage getting an a de accurate diagnosis. Sometimes um, these diagnoses can change a lot depending on who's giving the diagnosis. And informed decision making. So if, if um, doctor suggests that the child needs to take medication and you inform yourself about, um, you know, does this really, you know, what, what are the pros and cons of taking medication? Do all doc would all doctors do this? And, and doesn't mean you are going to, are going to do it or you aren't going to do it. It's just that you're being informed while you're doing it. And some people do very, very well in medication. And sometimes it's not very helpful. Personality disorders. Um, maladaptive, maladaptive pattern of inner experience and behavior, pervasive since adolescence. Um, the kinds of things you usually hear about here are borderline just, uh, personality disorder, just an instant stability in interpersonal relationships and self-image and impulsivity, and also black and white thinking, either you're all good or you're all bad. Um, narcissistic personality disorder is an inflated sense of self-importance. Histrionic self, um, personality disorder, you must be the center of attention. And sometimes these are the, one, some of the most difficult things for congregational members to to deal with because this is you have to realize that you can't change their personality and it's not your fault that they're behaving the way they are and you also either where it doesn't may not look like it but this person is suffering and many people that have personality disorders have have gotten them as a result of child abuse and you know they somehow learned how to do this behavior as a, as a child as to minimize the the effect that it would be on them and it persisted into their childhood they may not into their adulthood and they may not share your view of reality so they may not see things the same way that you do so if they're trying to change it's very difficult to change but it is possible i've known people that have you know borderline personality disorder have made really great great gains on it um, they've gotten Thera good therapy from a therapist who knows how to deal with it. Um, and you support their family too, because a lot of times people, families are suffering a lot. The best resource I can give you for learning how to set boundaries is a book called Walk Stop Walking on Eggshells. Um, and it's written by Paul Mason and Randy Krieger. Um, I think Randy is a UU. And it has um, a whole chapter in there on how to set boundaries. If someone had asked about how do you set boundaries, um, it's uh, chapter six in that book is setting boundaries and set skills. And it goes into a fair amount of detail on that. And it's, you know, uh, I think very, very helpful. So I would refer you to that. And another thing to do is a person has a, a personality disorder, it's probably a good thing that that person is not in a leadership position um, because sometimes they can in, uh, polarize a congregation and take them off in another direction um, and very, very disruptive. Okay, um, a co-occurring disorder, it means that in addition to having a mental disorder that we've just talked about, the person also has a substance disorder. And that that means that there's some kind of substance that they're taking where they, they've developed a tolerance, they need more and more and more of it. If they stop, they get withdrawal symptoms. They've, sometimes they've tried several times to quit and been unable to do it. It's compulsive, they keep having to do it and having to do it. They many times neglect some of their major life roles like working and so forth, and also doing things that are hazardous, driving uh, under the influence. And they keep using it even though they've had all these problems. So what I would suggest is if a person has a um, mental disorder to be screened for both substance abuse and mental disorder, because sometimes substance abuse is, um, is really a way of, of people trying to um, sort of 
deal with their mental disorder is the only way they can get relief from it. Um, and 12-step uh, or other peer support programs. Um, I know there's some um, non-religious programs as well that, that are very helpful to some people. Um, encourage them, then they get a, into a program, they treat both the abuse and the illness at, at the same time. Um, sometimes, uh, in previous, this is getting more common, but in previous years, if you, if you walked in into getting um, drug abuse um, help, that uh, they would say, well, you have a mental disorder, you have to get that cured first before we can help you. And then the, the opposite things happen when they go to get cured for mental health, but really treating them both at the same time is what they need. RAP groups are, are um, helpful. Also, don't be an enabler if the person is, uh, needs to be confronted or their family needs to be confronted. Um, you, you need to have lo love them enough to be able to, to stop that. And then setting boundaries if they're disruptive. Okay, um, death or su suicide is uh, fairly common, a common thought. Suicidal thinking is, is common for people with mental health difficulties. I know that was true for me. Um, and usually what the warning signs are is someone is thinking about death or suicide all the time, making final arrangements, giving away important possessions of theirs, um, sudden loss of interest in something which has been very important to them, um, a rapid increase in alcohol or drug abuse, um, very, very deep depression they can't shake. Um, sometimes it's a recently experienced loss of theirs. Um, and sometimes it happens, you, you think they've had a depression and they look like they're getting better. And then all of a sudden they uh, uh, die by suicide. So, um, it's required to get professional mental health care in these cases. Um, if an attempt, a suicide plan has been made, the person really needs to be in the hospital or get having um, very secure mental health care. Um, the way you would judge intent is, can there be intervention with this plan? Have they made the plan? Have they given away their treasured possessions? You also have to realize that sometimes suicides are impulsive and sometimes it just happens and nobody knows it's going to happen. So you, you can't blame yourself if something happens at, totally out of the blue. After a suicide, you suggest a family support group for the, uh, the family individual. I want to talk briefly about the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, that it's sort of the premier mental health organization. There is more than a thousand chapters in the United States, just about every community, major community. They have a wonderful education program for families called Family to Family Education. It's a 12-week program um, where families are taught by other family members who've been through it. They also have a fairly new peer-to-peer -peer education program. It's quite good. Um, you can um, uh, get to their website. It also has a, a information on, for faith communities called Faith Net NAMI. Well, families go through um, a shock first. The catastrophic event happens. They're thinking, oh no, what am I going to do? I'm crisis shock, hoping that it's not true. And eventually they go down to the, the, um, the circle on the bottom, they sort of learn to cope with it. Um, trying to keep the, what they need is networking, way to vent feelings, and so forth. And then eventually some people move on to doing advocacy. A lot of, a lot, there are a lot of advocates in, in NAMI, and NAMI itself can, um, is important in all these three stages. So in the catastrophic stage, what can you do? Comfort and empathy, suggest family education. In the coping stage, help them deal with the strong feelings that they're having and an advocacy stage, cheer them on, join them. And then also there's a, there's a handout, I think it's page uh, 27, on coping strategies for families. Um, again, just, you can just copy that page and give it to a family member. These are things that have helped other family members. Not everything is gonna help every person, but all these things have helped someone and um, basically 
getting your own help, learning about what's going on, learning how to communicate, help your loved one live with their illness and have a life of your own. Some psychotic symptoms can resemble spiritual experiences. And if anybody has read the Bible, they know that the, the patriarchs and the uh, prophets of most major religious traditions have seen uh, visions and heard voices. And um, when that's helpful to the person and the church, they are experiences of the holy. They need to be respected and honored instead of pathologized. So what would the faith leader do is try to distinguish between mental illness from a spiritual awakening. So uh, uh, if a per experience is described as being mystical, as near death, as revealing of universal religious truth, it's a finding out who or she or he really is, and do they have a curiosity about that experience, um, then this might be a spiritual awakening. And so one might determine what does this mean to you, ask them what does it mean to them. And if you refer them, you refer them to a therapist who will respect the healing nature of the spiritual transformation. This, they didn't used to be very many of these, but it's getting to be more uh, common these days. So pastoral care, um, realize that you're part of a team, you're working with prof professionals, you encourage education for all parties, develop a referral list, and uh, Make referrals when there's serious mood disorders, psychotic, anxiety, or the, if the person is suicidal. And a general rule is you counsel three times and then refer out. A lot of times you can ask a congregation just to um, confidentially give you, if they have a therapist that they would recommend a friend to, to give you the name of that therapist. And that's the way we de developed a referral um, list in our congregation and, and it was quite easy to do. So congregation needs um, education about mental health for ministers and lay leaders. That's what you're doing right now <laughs> for religious education teachers, for pastoral caregivers, a referral list, a covenant of right relations, like how, do, how we treat this, each other in this congregation, and then a disruptive behavior policy. So what is unacceptable behavior? What are consequences and what are the procedures? Better to have this in hand when than developing it on the fly when you need it. Web resources, which I think are helpful. There's, an, there's a, a website called Pathways to Promise, which is mental health information for faith leaders. It's an interfaith thing. So there's lots of, of examples of what other, kind, other faith um, traditions do and, and the, inter, the, um, the kinds of things that they have in place. Uh, FaithNet NAMI, I mentioned that it's, a, it's part of the NAMI website, a bunch of things for uh, faith resources for people with mental health problems. There's an organization by, um, called Mental Health Ministries. It's uh, written by a, a, um, a Methodist minister, a woman who had, has um, bipolar disorder, and she, it's an interfaith outreach. She's uh, developed a lot of really important things. And then um, what I mentioned before is a RAP plan, the organization called Mental Health Recovery is the one that has that um, web resource. And the handouts I've given to you are, uh, one of them is a, a really brief description that I wrote for ministers because they say they didn't have any time to read anything. <laughs> so I wrote something that they just have to read two pages um, about their whatever particular problem the person has. And then a handout which has more details and more resources and all of the various handouts that, that there are that I said. And there are example covenant right, right relations and disruptive behavior policies. And then this is how you can find me and I'd be happy to talk with you if you have any situation that you'd like to discuss. I'm, um, that's what I do <laughs> is um, my, with my ministry. And there's lots of stuff on, on the website that you see there. Um, it's a Mission Peak website. There's a, a section of it that has to do with me mental health ministry. Um, there's a, a, a curriculum that I wrote for congregations. There are a bunch of videos that I taped, um, half hour videos and also short videos that I taped of, of people telling their stories and just a, a number of other things that which might be helpful to you. So take a look at that. And um, so 
that's sort of the end of what I have to say. I know we're close to the end. I don't know if there's any questions that have come up. Thank you so much, Barbara.